Okay. Um, yeah, at any point, if you can't hear me, just let me know. You can text in the text message box right here, the chat box. Okay. I was just waiting for someone to show up so I can go ahead and start with chapter 11. It just so happens this is the exact same chapter I taught my other class today, my chemistry for engineer class. So they go a little bit more deeper than you guys do. But we're going to be going over chapter 11. And now my goal is to spread this out over three lessons, right? Because the, the assignments for this is due not this week, but after. But you still want to go ahead and start because this concept is one of those chapters where it is so abstract. And because it's abstract, it just requires a little bit more attention than the other chapters, OK? Before we get in chapter 11, I want to quickly review the other chapters that we covered. Oh, by the way, before I continue, do you have any questions? Feel free when you come in, if you have any questions about lab or whatever, to ask me. You know, I always have an agenda, so if, if nobody asks me any questions, I just continue my agenda. But if you do ask me a question, I will stop and answer the question, and then after that, I will go back to my agenda. Okay? So at any point, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the message box. I feel like I'm, I'm running a YouTube channel. <laughs> okay. I'm just laughing because I told my husband I'm a, I'm a Blackboard influencer, and I'm like, I told my students that nobody was really buying it, so... I guess it's not a thing. Anyway, I'll go ahead and stick with what I do best, which is chemistry. OK, chapter 11. In chapter 11, we're talking about the modern atomic theory, where we're going to be looking at the quantum model of the atom. But to quickly recap, before we get into the quantum model, I want to review the other three models we talked about so we can see where we're picking f up from. So before we got to this section, we're talking about three models. Dalton's atomic model, Dalton's model, he talked about the atom being round. So I'll call this Dalton's model. If you were asked to draw Dalton's model, you would draw it like that. Essentially, he said the atom is indivisible, which is another way of saying there's nothing inside the atom. So this is pretty much what you get. The atom is round. Let me make sure I am sharing. Okay, yeah. The atom is round and there's nothing inside of it. Okay. And then we had J.J. Thompson, whom I like to call J.J. like I know him from somewhere. J.J. Thompson talks about the plum pudding model. So you got plum and you got pudding. Now, the plum pudding model is that kind of like a donut hole because it, it's round, but it's more like a muffin. Okay, so you have a blueberry, like a blueberry muffin. So you have a, a meal that's called a pudding, that's plum pudding. And it looks more like a donut hole, but it's a lot larger, like a muffin. And it's got blueberries in it. So the idea is where you have blueberries is where the electrons will be. And these will be negative. And then the interior or the core of the atom will be positive. And according to J.J. Thompson, the atom is overall is neutral in charge. When he's saying it's neutral in charge, he means, this means positive charge equal negative charge, right? The positive charge cancels out the negative charge. That means if you find the atom, it is neutral, okay? And this is what we get from J.J. Thompson, whom I like to call J.J. And then finally, we have his ex-best friend. History doesn't call him his ex-best friend, I do. Rutherford. And Rutherford is his student, Rutherford. His student who tried to go out and help JJ out by proving his atomic model, but instead came up with his own model. And his model is called the nuclear model, nuclear model. This is a model where they discover the nucleus and they notice the nucleus of the atom was positive. Then around the atom, you have negatively charged electrons, but this time the electrons are very tiny. Unlike over here, J.J. Thompson implied 
the elections were kind of big from the way he was he was talking about it the plum pudding model and everything he was trying to imply the elections were significant and they were large but here rutherford realizes the elections are there but it's almost like they're not there they're, they're very tiny they don't occupy a lot of space long story short we know they're there because the atom is still neutral that means if you have positive charge you gotta have negative charge right because positive charge must equal negative charge but the negative charge electrons are so tiny even though they occupy all this available space here okay so these are the first three prominent models of the atom remember once again this would be like if you were really into phones let's say the iphone it would be like iphone one two three right each new year you're getting a new phone the new phone is able to do so much more the next year you're getting a newer phone at some point you're looking at iphone 10 iphone 11 and you're asking yourself what is the difference right but the idea with these models is we have a newer model because the newer model is doing so much more and it's answering questions the the older model could not answer okay the time between each of these models life is happening so what's changing as we're learning these new models well time passes right for sure time passes and then we see this happening technology improving and then people are doing a lot of experiments even though we don't hear much much about it but the knowledge base, so the amount of knowledge out there is increasing. In other words, people know more about atoms, kind of like, I know this is a source site, but I have to talk about it, okay? From the first time the, the whole corona thing happened, from the first time it came out, which I would say in America around March, right, till now, the knowledge base of corona has increased because we know more about it now than we did then. You know, back in March, we didn't know much about it. So the only thing that we had to do at that point was to stay home. Now we know that we can wear a mask. We can do a lot of other things, which I won't get into, right? But to be able to kind of have an almost normal life. But as the knowledge base increase, it gives us more power to be able to do more. So as time is passing, technology is improving, knowledge base is increasing, scientists are asking questions, right? Like, okay based on the most modern uh, model we have right here the the nuclear model how come when you take atoms or you take some kind of matter and you apply heat to it sometimes the atoms glow or the matter glows or in some cases it releases light so where is all this light coming from you ask Rutherford I don't know JJ JJ had nothing to say so it's like scientists could not use these old models here to explain where light was coming from. So in this chapter, let me give you the summary before we get into it. This is like the, you know, trying to introduce the chapter before it comes in. In chapter 11, we look at the two more recent models and probably you recognize this. We have the Bohr's model, Bohr's model. So this is scientists called Bohr. And then we have the quantum mechanical model that is not named after one scientist because a bunch of them got together and each one kind of gave their peace of mind the work they were doing to come up with a quantum mechanical model. So I kind of give this an abbreviation. This is my job, y'all. So I got to make it fun. I just call this QM squared to kind of make it like, you know, cute and everything. But it's just a quantum mechanical model, okay, a.k.a. QM squared. This is the model, the most co common model. Now, is this term common among scientists? No. If I say, you know, Q QM squared, they'll look at me like, what are you talking about? So I have to say the quantum mechanical model when I get to, when I get around like-minded people, right, trying to fit in and everything. Anyway, chapter 11, we're going to be examining Bohr's model and then the quantum mechanical model. The quantum mechanical model is the newest model out there, okay? In the world of science, when you say newest, <laughs> oh, this is supposed to be a circle, okay? This newest model is, is close to 100 years old. It would be like saying, well, how old, how long have you had your, your cell phone for 100 years? That's not 
new. That's all. But in the world of science, especially chemistry, things don't change that much. So when you say new and you're like 100 years old, they're like, oh, that's still a baby. It's still young, right? This, this model is close to 100 years old. Before that model, we had the Bohr's model. And Bohr's model is a planetary model. This is a model where, let me see if I can get the orbit here. You have the sun. Oh, this is called the planetary model where in the planetary model you had the sun in the middle and the sun here will represent the nucleus the position of the sun is in the nucleus and you have you know uh what's it called planets orbiting around the sun different planets and here the planets represent the electrons right so just replace the sun with the nucleus and the planets with the electrons and you got you a Bohr's model and this is a planetary model. This model right here is the most famous model. It's the popular model. Hollywood likes this model. If you've watched Big Bang Theory, that's the model they use to introduce, you know, when they go from one scene to another, you know, they have that sound. Woo! Okay, so I don't really know the sound very well. That's how I imagine it in my head. But they show, I don't know how to make, to, to remake the sound, but they show, you know, from one episode to another, they show the Boris model from one episode to another or one scene to another. If you ever watch Jimmy Neutron, no shame. In college, that was my go-to. When I needed a distressor, Jimmy Neutron was my thing. I'm up there watching it. And once again, they show you that planetary model. So it's very popular. And when, when Hollywood is trying to communicate, hey, science, 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 this is one of the big things they go to. It's Bohr's model. Even though in the world of science, world of chemistry, we know it's an old model, OK? It's just an easier model to go to. Quantum mechanical model, <laughs> I'll just say it doesn't really have another name. I'll say with this one here, it's complicated. The description of this model, which we're going to get to, you see, is such that in the, okay, we have a nucleus in the middle, but in the, in the, in the description of the model, it looks like you have balloon animals inside the atom. So you have spherical shape. You have dumbbell shape and you have different shapes. So in the end, by the time you're done doing all this in here, it just looks like a big mess. So it's even difficult to go online and Google quantum mechanical model and see a picture. Okay. But this is going with this. So we'll start with Bohr's model and why there was a need for a new model. Remember, in science, we are always moving to a new model because the current model is not working for one reason or another, okay? And we're never satisfied. That's just the world of scientists, okay? We don't come here. Yeah, we're always thinking there's something better out there. Anyway, so let's go to the first slide. It starts with this. Electromagnetic radiation. Okay, I thought we're talking about quantum mechanical model. Yes, we are. So why, oh, this is me doing a question and answer. So then why are we starting with electromagnetic radiation? Here's the thing. Scientists notice, right? Because they're always observing, always asking questions. There was an era in time where scientists were obsessed with light and the behavior of light. They started noticing that sometimes atoms produce light. So atoms produce light. when heated. So they notice that, okay, contrary to what they thought. So up until this point, scientists just thought that atoms, so this is what they thought. They thought atoms had particle behavior. So I'm gonna give you just the overall evidence. So how do you decide that the atom has particle behavior if it has certain properties, okay? So here's how it works. You're working with the element, you're working with the atom or the compound. And then the notice that they had, if since the atoms tend to have a very specific mass, they occupy volume or even have their own volume, and then they have momentum or they have speed, they're like, okay, these are the kind of properties that we give particles. So it's almost like a lawyer in the courtroom trying to justify based on the following experiences or based on the following qualifications, we can say the atom is a particle, right? So scientists were like, okay, 
the atom has a mass, it has a volume, it can have momentum. Based on the following, the atom is a particle. What they weren't expecting, though, was later on, as they saw that the, the atom can produce light, they noticed that the atom also had wave nature. So it's like, how does one particle have two natures that are so different? Okay, so let me digress a little bit, okay? Because once again, as I told you guys in my journey of learning chemistry, the reason, the reason why chemistry for me became uh, like biology in a way, the way biology is to other people like home, is because after a while oops, struggling with chemistry, I realized that I was able to actually uh, relate this to life around me. As, as I got more life experiences, I'm like, okay, I can see that. So what they were noticing was atoms had two behaviors or two sets of behaviors or existence. Okay. One was as a particle. The other one was as a wave. And sometimes both of those nature exist together. Without going into more details, it would be like people saying that humans have many nature, right? Oh, well, you have your body, you have your soul. And depending on if you're spiritual or religious, you say you have a spirit. And these are distinct natures in this in one person, right? And they kind of coexist, but the characteristics are not necessarily the same. So just like you have humans having body, soul, and spirit, you have the atom having particle nature and wave nature. There's certain characteristics that we have that we say this makes you, you know, have a body. The body is tangible. You can touch it. You can feel it. It's there. You can see it. The soul and the spirit you can't see, but you can tell they're there for certain characteristics. So the way I think about it is the wave nature of the atom we can't see. For the most part, we can't see most of the wave nature. The particle nature is more the tangible, tangible part. So for me, this is more like the body, right? When you see a table and you feel the table, all of those are the particle natures of the table allowing you to touch it, to feel it, to weigh the table, okay? Now that we understand this, we can then move on. So now we are learning about electromagnetic radiation because this topic here focuses on light. We're learning about light. Understanding light, so understanding light helps us to understand wave nature of electron. And why is it important for us to understand? Because scientists notice that ultimately the wave nature determined the behavior, behavior of atoms. Okay. So once again, we understand light because understanding light helps us understand the wave nature of electrons behavior and then ultimately behavior of atoms. Okay, so moving on. Now I'm finally making going to make progress here. We are learning that light is an electromagnetic radiation. Okay. So we're looking at electromagnetic radiation. This term here, electromagnetic has two parts. Electro comes from the electric field and then magnetic comes from the magnetic field. So when we look at light, any form of light, Light is made up of two types of waves that coexist together, the electric wave and the magnetic wave, or one that responds to electricity, one that responds to magnets. Example of electromagnetic radiation, like a general example, of course, we know visible light, gamma rays, X rays, ultraviolet rays, visible rays, infrared light. We also have microwaves, radio waves, and then long radio waves, okay? So number one, there are many different forms of electromagnetic radiation. There isn't just one. The visible light that we know of is one of the many radiations, okay? So when it comes to atoms, atoms release so many different kinds of radiation. We don't just have 
one type of radiation released by atoms, okay? Number two, the energy is transmitted at a speed of light. So any of these waves here is transmitted at a speed of light. That is 3.00 times 10 power 8 meters per second. By the way, you want to write this down. So any of these radiations mentioned up here, this one here, this, 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 this. These travel at speed, I should say C, the symbol here is C for speed, speed at 3.00 times 10 power 8 meters per second, okay? Then we have this number in miles per hour. We normally use meters per second, so go with that number. Okay, so we're told that light, because remember, we're trying to learn about light to learn about the electron. Light has wave-like properties that can be described by a wave equation. So we have this equation right here, and you guys should be having a lab that requires you to use this wave equation which is the speed of light. So C stands for the speed of light. Let me see, do I have any way to write? I'll write here. C is the speed of light. Speed of light. And then you get this, which is the wavelength. This is a symbol for the wavelength. And then you got this, which is the symbol for frequency. So we're told, if you have a wave, waves have certain properties. It's like saying animals have certain properties that make them animals. Well, waves have certain properties that make them waves. So when you see a wave, when you see a wave, when you encounter a wave, there's certain properties that you expect the wave to have. Each wave tends to have a speed. Each wave tends to have a wavelength. Each wave tends to have a frequency. So these are related like this. The speed of the wave is equal to the wavelength times the frequency right here. And then we're being told wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. So here's the thing. While we're looking at this picture right here, I want to talk about this in just a second. So I need to define some more information here before we get to that picture. Let me show you how we measure the wavelength. If I said measure the length of a ruler, you would say, okay, here's a ruler, get a tape measure, go from one end to the other, and that will be the length of the ruler. Well, how do we measure the length of a wave? We're told, and we'll be told this later on, I just feel like it's, it's important for us to discuss the wavelength so we can compare it in the picture. You can have an intense wave, intense, like this. Okay, or you can have a mellow wave. Mellow wave. So I usually joke around here and I say, This is me and this is my husband. Okay, he's, I guess he's taking a break. Yeah, it's that time. This is me. I'm more like high energy. He's more like low energy. And he's mellow. And he's calm and collected. Me, I'm like, yeah, where is it? Where's the party? That's me. You know, I'm like jumping from one thing to another. <laughs> That's me. And in this case here, when you look at this high energy wave, the distance between the highest points, by the way, these highest points are called peaks, like a peak on the mountain. And then the low points are called trough. I think like a feeding trough. Where else would you, do we use the word trough? I don't know. Feeding trough. So, like, if I was asked to name this, I would say the, the peak and the valley, but they call it the peak and the trough. So, if you can find two adjacent next to each other peaks and measure that distance, that's called the wave length. Okay? Or you can do a side-by-side -side trough, like adjacent next to each other trough, and that would be also a wave length. Of course, the wave has consistent cycles, right? So that is the wavelength. So from the two pictures I have of the two different waves, the top one has got short wavelengths. The bottom one has very long wavelengths. You can see that it's much bigger. The waves are more spaced out. Okay, that's lower energy, mellow, calm, not in a hurry. So we see that also in oceans, as oceans, you know, have, uh, what do we call those? Waves, I guess waves, right? Beach waves? Okay, yeah, waves. 
<laughs> I usually rely on my husband to remind me of words, but yeah, he's not here now. He, he yeah, like ways exactly. They're called ways. So I, when I'm trying to take a break though, I need environments that are opposite to me. So I like to go to uh, oceans where they have mellow, low energy ways, and that, that usually helps a lot. So the next thing we want to know is terminology. More terminology such as how high up the wave goes and how low the wave goes. So usually the waves are drawn with an axis going through them. So some waves have very high peaks and the distance from the core, the center to the highest peak is called the amplitude. The amplitude sometimes talks about the brightness. If you have a light bulb that's very bright, usually we assume the wave has a very high amplitude, right? Just, this is more like a FYI, but that's called the amplitude. And then we have the frequency. So frequency has to do with how many complete cycles of the wave you have in a section. So let me try to make these even like this. And let's see how many complete waves we have. I'll start from this side here to here, uh, from here to, oh, here. This is one complete wave, second complete wave, third complete wave, fourth complete wave. And, oh, let's do it like this. Fifth complete wave. So in my top waves, I have five complete waves. Okay, that will be my, my frequency. On the bottom one from here to here to, mm, if, I squeeze, if I squeeze this a little bit over, I probably would have had two complete waves. Let's just say two complete waves for the sake of making it easier. Complete waves. So since I have more complete waves on top, I can say with the high energy wave, I also have high frequency, have high occurrences, right? Frequency. Now I can't spell and talk at the same time. But to have a high energy wave, you also have a high frequency wave because the waves are traveling frequent to the, through the same spot. But at the same time, your wavelength is lower. So hopefully you can see that, right? Wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. So from the picture I have here, when the energy is high, so is the frequency. But as a result, we have a low wavelength. So the wavelength is always opposite to the trend of the frequency and to the trend of the energy. So just FYI, make sure you have this written down, okay? That the energy is inversely proportional to the wavelengths energy proportional to frequency and then when it comes to frequency and wavelength of course they're also inversely proportional that means that when one goes up the other goes down here when one goes up the other also goes up just fyi okay that's the relationship based on this picture right here since i have a whole story behind this this is how I, this is how I recall stuff. Like if I can make a story out of it, I can tell you what happened because it's not just memorizing anymore. It's a story. Okay. Now that we understand this, now you guys can appreciate what we are going through right now, examining the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's so many different spectrums out there of different waves. We are just focusing on the electromagnetic spectrum right here. So on this one here, let's start with the fun section. I call this section here the fun section. Why? Well, around here is where you have your cell phone. Yeah. Cell phone, internet. This is the section right here. So if you like the cell phone, the internet, I mean, come on. Today, in this day and age, we enjoy that. So this is around this area right here. And then, of course, you have your radio waves right here, AM and FM. So let me age myself. I don't mind. When I was younger, and also being from a third world country, things progressed a little slower. When I was younger, it was very uh, hip to say, what's your favorite radio station? And it's not, it's not like we really care what the frequency was. It was trying to figure out, are you cool or not? When you're young, that's a very important thing to establish with your friends. So if your radio station was AM, you were sort of not cool. If 
your radio station was FM, you were it because FM radio just had more clarity. It was more cl clear. The sound had just such beautiful ranges. The deep was deep, was the bass was bass. I mean, like, oh my goodness, I mean, you gotta have it right. And then AM had a lot of static. It was a low quality, you know, cheap radios. So it's like, hey, what's your radio station? Ah, mine is 101.5 FM. Oh, you're cool. What is yours? Mine is 99.9 .9 AM. Who does AM? You know, so you kind of keep it on low key in the raps. Anyway, yeah, so that, that was the thing, you know, that was the thing. And of course you had, the, yeah, you have the car where you twist the dial, you know, until you find your radio station when it connects. Yeah, that's my jam right there. You know, now you, you, what do you do? You press your iPod and then it just kind of goes and you're like, okay. It's, to me, it's not as satisfactory as trying to find right between that frequency, right? Until you've done that, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm biased. It's just a different experience. And of course, I have microwaves. So microwaves are right here. And they're dangerous because they, they can't. So as we're looking at this, please notice, on the right side of the scale, you have the more mellow waves, right? So you can see these have a longer wavelength. And by having a longer wavelength, they will have lower energy and lower frequency, right? Because of just how the wave looks. So when you were listening to the video, you're on your cell phone. I mean, I've, I've had, I've read all the conspiracy cell phone causes all these problems. I'm like, yeah, cell phone could penetrate your body and cause all this illness. I'm not going to refute that. But so will radio waves and microwaves because all those waves have higher energy than your cell phone. Do you see that? As we go left, the space between the waves decreases. And by the way, the higher the energy of the wave, the more penetrating and therefore the more, oh, can I type, can I penetrating and therefore the more damage people wear protection around the radio waves. You're not going to wear protection to get into your jam session or to be on a cell phone, but people wear protection when they're around x-rays or gamma rays. So I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to argue one way or another. As a scientist, I present the information and then you make a judgment of it. You're free to go and study some more, okay? I don't take sides. I just present the information. So I'm just saying, if the cell phone is bothering you, then you should be bothered by everything to the left of the cell phone, which is radio waves, microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, which is from the sun, the light that we can see, the light bulb in your room, x-rays, gamma rays, okay? So then of course visible light any light that we see beautiful colors colors from clothes all that stuff the range is right here so please notice all the other ones are shown as dark not because because they're dark it's just because we can't see them right science is people centric we write science for us so if we can't see it it's shown as dark but the part that we can see is this right here please notice the visible spectrum is written as no this is not Viv G or which is the, the reverse of Roy G Biv. So you got your red color right here, and then you got your blue color right here. And so I was telling my morning class, they're very chatty. I, I like the chattiness. They're very chatty. So I'm like, they're like, I was gonna do Roy G Biv. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, I have never seen people that excited about this chapter. So when I'm showing them this, I'm like, okay, so why if red, according to this, is towards the lower energy end, right? And then blue is towards the higher energy end. What we're saying is red heat is lower in energy and less hot than blue heat. If that's the case, why do you have these trucks that have these symbols? Or if, even if there's a fire, right? They tend to use red flames to indicate hot red flames red fire truck red 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 to indicate danger they even call the lady in red lady in red nobody said lady in blue nobody sang a song about a lady walking into a room wearing a blue dress right but they sang a song about a lady walking in a room with red so why red and of course they're like well you know psychologically man they're trying to be deep but the bottom line is this yeah they, they are writing about the psychology part 
as humans, we respond to red color. And there's something that scientists have noticed a long time ago. We respond to red color in an urgent way. So it was better to use red color to indicate urgency than blue color. And they're like, blue is cool and chill. I'm like, yeah, that's why blue is my favorite color. I like red too. It's just red is too energetic for me. It's not energetic. It's just it, blue for me is cool, you know? Yeah, cool and calm. Even though technically on this chart, blue is hotter. So think about it, right? When people are welding, they use a welding light the torch, welding torch, that, that flame that's coming out looks almost white. It's actually more of a blue color there that you're seeing, okay? It's not red, not like the, the, the fire you have from the stove at home because blue is a lot hotter and, yeah, than red, okay? So once again, the reason why fire trucks are red and not blue, if a huge blue fire truck was coming towards you, you probably don't even move over because you psychologically you just won't respond to blue as you would red okay and then notice that right next to the color red you have infrared and then the color oh i say blue here technically this is more like a let's say viv gior this is supposed to be viv gior viv this is more like a violet here yeah this here is more like a violet so right above violet we have ultra violet that's the light we get from the sun and then so you got the sun and of course we get we wear sunscreen from the sun they tell us oh please wear sunscreen then we got x-rays right here and then we got gamma rays so let me talk about this no gamma rays does not form people does not cause people to become buff even though on tv the gamma rays produce the hulk in real life it just causes cancer okay so i go to my dentist right and he's like okay so we're going to do an x-ray and I'm looking at him like, okay, like, is this really necessary? Because <laughs> and I'm trying not to be that patient, right? Because in my head, I'm like, x-ray is right next to gamma rays. And then the energy level increases as you go left in that one chart, right? Because here we have high frequency and then we have high energy. And normal people don't think like this. Not me. I'm like, I'm looking at this chart. Every time I go to him, it's like, well, can you get the most modern or the most recent x-rays? And I'm like, really? And the technician is like, oh, I messed up. I'm sorry. Can I take one more x-ray? I'm like, ma'am, I need you to get it right, okay? I'm trying to make sure I don't get very exposed to the x-rays because they are very penetrating. They have high energy. You see how close they are to each other? And, of course, down here they have pictures of objects. And then you see right here, yeah, objects based on size. So you can see here, dog is really big. You have quarters. You have a dime thickness, animal cell, bacterial cell. So between these two, animal cell is bigger than bacterial cell. And then of course, this year, year 2020, the year of the virus. I won't even, you know what? Yeah, just moving on. Virus right there that can infect animal cell and bacterial cell. Then you have the atom. So this is just showing you that the atom is a lot smaller than the virus, okay? But yeah. If you happen to work as a nurse in, in the doctor's office, they will, they will put lead in the walls to protect the healthcare providers. If you're getting an x-ray, you get a lead vest. That very heavy vest they give you is a lead vest because that actually hinders x-rays from, it actually blocks x-rays from traveling through. So I'm usually asking like, do you have a bigger one? Can I go on like Amazon and buy my own. And they look at me like, why can't you just be a compliant patient? And I'm like, I am. But this picture right here, right? No, I haven't actually bought one. Have I gone to look for one? Yeah. I've looked. It's expensive and it's very heavy. And it's full of lead. You want to bring that to your home and have it hanging around. Okay. But yeah, that's even the radiation. So after moving on and seeing the radiation, now we're looking at two concepts. Continuous spectrum versus line spectrum. These kind of go hand in hand. When we have a light at home, the incandescent light bulb that looks like this. You have a bulb, you have a tungsten filament right here, and then that looks like that, okay? That bulb tends to produce white light, and they call that the standard light bulbs. And in that white light, the metal that's here is usually called tungsten, and it has the symbol W. This, this metal, when you pass electricity through it, 
it shines bright like a white light. And if you are able to take that white light and split it into so many different components, you get a continuous spectrum. So they're telling you, you get a continuous spectrum when it's passed through a prism. So let me see if I can show you a picture of this. Oh, this is a picture of the waves. I've already done that part. Oh, here. So when white light is concentrated right here and passed through the pr prism, the prism is here for separating. We're trying to figure out, because we know that white light is technically a mixture of lights. Most of the lights we see are actually a mixture, a mixture of different lights. So we're trying to separate white light into its components so we can see what different lights mix together to make white light. And when you look over here, again, you get a uh, uh, Vib Gior. So you got Roy G. Bib in the, in the reverse. You have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? White light is a mixture of all those colors together. But you can only see that once you separate the mixture so you can see the individual components, okay? And we see that with a regular light bulb. And then if you look at these, it's technically a band of colors, but it looks like tie dye, right? Once again, I found out tie dye is in. So it looks like tie dye where one color is bleeding into another. So this is called a continuous spectrum. Continuous spectrum. I think that's the spelling. I couldn't remember this morning. I can't remember it right now, but continuous spectrum. Why? Because you don't have any separation of the color bands. You see here, there is no separation of color bands. They're just kind of bleeding into each other. The violet bleeds into the indigo, the blue, the G-Y-O-R, right? Like tie dye, they're just kind of fading or bleeding into each other. On the other hand, with the line spectrum, the spectral lines that appear when light, light is emitted from a sample of an analyzed, or when a sample is analyzed in the spectroscope, this one here has discrete lines and there's a separation between those lines. So we're told here there's separate lines of color to indicate that they're individually distinct. Okay, so before I come back to this statement here, let me go find a picture that illustrates that because this is a picture down here. Oh, there it is. So one of your labs that you're going to be working on, and if we were on campus, we'll do this particular experiment. Okay, so on campus, we have this tube called a spectral tube. It was designed for this purpose here. We actually buy this where a company makes this tube. And what they do is they take a hydrogen gas and they pump it into a tube and then they seal it up. And then we take that tube and then we pass electricity through the tube. I mean, there's a device that we connect the tube to and it passes electrical energy. And so what happens is changes happen to the hydrogen atom to where they produce a purple color. And you can see the purple color, right? Purple colored light. So in the lab, that tube will look like a fluorescent tube, but instead of producing a nice white light, it produces a purple colored light. So it's bright, but it's purple, okay? Well, once again, we're trying to ask, how many different colors got mixed together to make that purple? How do we find out what's in that purple colored light? Purple light. Well, we do what we normally do, which is to concentrate the light here so we can focus it, right? So we can, we can have enough. And then the prism separates the light. So we're trying to sort it out to see which one is which. And then here it produces the components. So what we were seeing as purple, our eyes were not able to separate it for us. So we, we use this device and it shows us that the purple is made up of a violet color, violet. This one here is something that's called blue violet. This one here is called blue green. And this one here is called red. So what we saw as violet color or violet light is made up of these four colors. So we are told if you want to see that kind of purple light, you got to get the gas discharge tube or spectral tube that has hydrogen in it. 
So if we were on campus, we tend to use this experiment for different elements. We have one with mercury and it forms its own bands. We have one with neon and it forms its own color. I think, was it the mercury? One of them formed like a dark and disturbed red looking like an angry red, like red. And it's like a different color. It's not bright red. No, it's like an angry looking. I call it an angry looking red, like a deep red, not really a burgundy, you know. Anyways, so we split it and we try to see the components that make up that color. It's very interesting. Anyway, to me, it is interesting. So we are learning here, right, that these colors we're seeing are actually a mixture of colors. So my, my, my class this morning, you know, they're very chatty. They're like, wait a minute. Is that how we get the different colors in neon? I'm like, well, technically, yeah, but... What we are being told here is each element has its own color. You have all these neon signs that have different colors. And my question at that point is, if neon produces one color light, how do you get the same neon to produce different colors? That's because they're an engineering student. And that's when you guys come in. If you want, you know, hydrogen produces purple color. If you want hydrogen to produce red color, you separate it and then just make sure these don't show up. We only see the red. So how they're able to do that, I don't know. I don't do engineering, right? I don't do engineering. They, they, they are the ones who do. They're like, oh, it's so cool. I'm like, it is, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're those kind of kids. They're really into this stuff. Okay. So after we've seen all that, we are being told, please realize each element has its own unique line spectrum. Each element has, produces a color that when you separate, it forms a unique light spectrum. Well, chemists are notorious for if anything is unique, they're like, ooh, we will use this to identify the elements. So they use the line spectra to identify the element. So there was one semester where uh, we don't do that anymore for your signature assignment, which I'll talk about after exam number two. But... I used to have them use the line spectra technique to identify an element that killed somebody. This is not a real story. This is a made up story. I'm like, okay, there was a murder that took place and use the line spectra te technology to, to argue for or against a certain, uh, what is it called? Poison, okay? All they had to do was focus on the science. Oh my goodness, this one girl went above and beyond. She did use the science to prove what the element was, but then she also gave a motive on why the person was killed. And then she's right, she's like, uh huh, they were killed because I'm like, that's not part of the science. We just, can't. but I read the whole thing. <laughs> I was so curious to know why they died. She went all out and they just came up with the story. <laughs> The point, though, was just to say that you can use line spectra to prove the presence of elements, okay? Yeah. So after we've done all that, scientists do that. Energy released by electrons is in the form of massless packets called electromagnetic radiation. Okay. So as we're moving on here, remember, we started off looking at light. We wanted to know about light to learn about electrons. With the electrons, we ultimately learn about matter. So we've been looking at properties, all these properties here. These are light properties that are also electron properties. But then down here, we're being told that energy is released in the form of massless packets of electromagnetic radiation known as photons. When you have, fo when light is being released in packets called photons, it's almost like atoms of light, but it's not really the same concept, same idea. The photon is the fundamental unit that produces light, okay? And I, I'm, yeah, I've never really done experiments with photons, so it's hard for me to really even explain that to you. It would be like atoms are to elements what photons are to light. So if you're trying to look at the basic unit of light, it's pretty much photons. And the basic unit of elements is atoms, that, the idea, the building block, okay? So we're told here that there is a wave-particle duality in light. And I told you guys before, there's also a wave-particle dual nature in electrons. That just means that light has got two natures. Light behaves both like waves 
and like particles. So light has both wave-like properties and particle-like properties. When light is not being released as a wave, but as a photon, that's particle behavior, okay? So we talked about this before, long wavelengths, short wavelengths. I'm going to go over that again. I've described these two, so I'm done with that. Oh, here they're showing you other, the line spectra of hydrogen, right? It's showing you the colors. We see four bands. The one of mercury, we do this on campus too. See mercury? The one for neon. So if you were given this, you can actually work your way backward and say, for sure, this is mercury. Sorry, this is hydrogen, mercury, and neon, okay? Because it kind of works like that. Okay. So after learning all that, were we trying to understand the atom? Yes. So why does Bohr's model then come in here? Let me tell you the, co the correlation. Bohr is a scientist. That answered the question where does light come from in the atom? Okay, so remember, science, we're working with atom, playing around with it, trying to figure out what will happen, applying electricity and realizing some atoms were able to, put, some of them just glowed, some were able to release light. Well, where's the light coming from? We know we have protons, neutrons and electrons inside the atom, but what is producing this light? Bohr's model was able to tell us where the light came from, and then he was able to explain the line spectra. All other scientists up until this point couldn't explain what the electrons were really doing. Bohr did an excellent job at explaining the line spectra. Okay, so he said in his model that of course, the atom is round. Nobody had any question about that. It consists of extremely dense nucleus that contains all of the atom's positive charge and nearly all of its mass. So he is repeating what uh, Rutherford said. Rutherford said the same thing. He said the atom's nucleus had all of the positive charge, and he also said nearly all of its mass. And then... Bohr also said the negatively charged electrons of very small mass, right? These electrons are very small, travel in orbits around the nucleus. Nah, now this is new information. Because information, if I can spell it right. Because all this stuff before, this is like a repeat. We're like, dude, we heard this before from Rutherford. Tell us something new. This right here is new information, okay? And of course, he agrees with Rutherford that the electrons don't take up a lot of space. So the area in the atom around the nucleus where the electrons are is mostly empty space because the electrons are there, but they're not really taking up a lot. They're very, very tiny. They're like clouds. So, yeah. And then he says, for hydrogen atom, energy of its electron and the radius of the rays are qu quantized, okay? So let me do some interpretation here because, you know, as a student, huh, back in the days, back in the good old days, these days are good too. <laughs> well, this year is different. Anyway, back in the days, right, I'm reading this and I'm like, what in the energy of its electron and the radius of its orbit are quantized? What does that mean exactly? Now spend hours getting two or three different books trying to figure out what this means. And we need to learn what quantize means, right? Quantize means here that they have a amount limited to a specific value. So let me try to paraphrase this in context. Bohr's model. One, two, three, four. Okay, so let's make this a nucleus right here. And this nucleus is where our positive charge is. Then we have energy level one, energy level two, energy level three, energy level four, okay? So, oh, by the way, when I wrote N1, N2, N3, N4, those are the different energy levels. So let me start with this. Go back to the beginning. Boris said here 
that the electrons are very small and they travel in orbits around the nucleus. So let me start with that before I get into this part here. Think about it this way. The way I envisioned this was this central part here was like downtown. And then there were all these circular streets around downtown. So the closer the street was to the center of the town, the lower the energy. In this case, of course, we have a nucleus in the middle, and then you have energy level one, two, three, four. So these N1, N2, N3, N4, I'll just say here, as N value increases, comma, so does energy, okay? So the, there are different electrons. For the sake of my illustration, let me give you four electrons. So I'm going to say electron one. This electron one is in the first orbit. Electron two, second orbit. Electron three, third orbit. Electron four, fourth orbit, okay? For my illustration, I have four or orbits. I still haven't explained the terminology. I'm getting to a point. So he said, by the way, the n value is called the energy level. And he will, he will call the n value energy level later on. But I feel like it's good for us to learn it right now so we can use it. By the time we're using it later on, we're more familiar with it. The smaller the orbit, the smaller the energy level. Remember, these circles here are called orbits, like an orbit, right? And in the analogy that I'm giving you guys, it's kind of like the orbit of the planet of the planets or a highway. So according to Bohr, the electron circulates around nucleus in an orbit. This is according to Bohr. So you ask him, Bohr, where is the electron? Well, depending on which electron we're talking about, it is circulating around the nucleus in an orbit. Bottom line, that's what he said. He says so, yeah, right here, his second bullet point. Now, let me go ahead and explain this part here. When they say that the electron and the orbit, the radius of the orbit is quantized. So here's a rule, an unsaid rule. The orbit around the nucleus has a specific energy. The electron in the orbit has a specific energy. I just paraphrase quantize. This means quantize, right? When you have a specific value. Ooh, quantize. I can't spell quantize. Okay. So bottom line, orbit energy equal electron energy. Okay. So for the electron to be allowed to be on the orbit, it has to have an energy that matches the orbit, okay? Remember I told you guys, as the n value increases, the energy. So the one that's n is four, E4 has really high energy, okay? So I'm gonna ask a question, then I'm gonna answer it because I do things like that. Okay, so here's the question. If electron one, E1, is usually found on this energy level, do we ever find it anywhere else? And the answer is yes. Well, how can E1 end up on energy level four? N4, okay. For me to explain that part, let me go ahead and assign values to each energy level. For N is one, I'll make this what? 100 joules of energy. N is two, 200 joules of energy. N is three, 300 joules of energy. These are not the actual values. The actual values are a little bit more complicated. I'm just showing you these values to make a point. And then N is four, 400 joules of energy, okay? So let's say uh, I need the space right here. I'm gonna erase that. If you wanna look at that, just go ahead and rewind it. 
rewind the video. Okay, so let's say our electron is trying to go to n is 4. Our electron E1, I also need to bring another point. There's something called the ground state. So let me erase this part here because, yeah, there's a lot in chemistry. Ground state and excited state. So ground state, ooh, state. Ground state is also called like the home state. This is where you normally find the electron. You normally find electron. So according to Bohr, if you're trying to look for the electron and he's asking you, well, which electron? Oh, the one in the N is one level. Oh, yeah, just look somewhere on the orbit, you find it. Okay. Then excited state is the electron at a higher energy level, okay? Or higher energy level orbit. I just messed this one here. Ooh, what did I do? Let me see if I can go back because I think I missed. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can just erase this part here. That's a lot better. Ooh, that was close. So now that we understand ground state and excited state, Let's look at electrons. So we'll start with electron one being currently at 100 joules. On energy level one, n is equal to one, it has 100 joules of energy. So let's say our electron wants to go to energy level four. Well, the electron is not allowed on energy level four until it, it has earned its way to energy level four. What do we say? Orbit energy has to match electron energy. What is the energy requirement of energy level four? 400 joules. So what must the electron go through to gain 400 joules or to get to 400 joules? It has to gain 300 joules, correct? If it gains 300 joules, now it's new energy, new total energy is at 400 joules. All of a sudden, now you got electron one, it has graduated to this level. Electron one is here. Electron one is now considered to be excited. It's like, yes, I have made it to energy level four, okay? We now have an electron one at energy level four a higher energy level. Why? Because it gained 300 joules of energy. It's new energy matches the orbit energy. So it's not violating any rules. Okay. Well, all good things must come to an end. That's not a chemistry rule. <laughs> but the rule in chemistry is the excited state is temporary. That's the chemistry version. The excited state is temporary. You can't be excited forever. You got to go back home, right? So here the rule is Excited state is temporary. I start talking and I forget how to spell temporary, right? So the electron has to go back home. Well, for the electron to be back at its home or its ground state, for it to even be allowed back home, it has to now get back to 100 joules of energy. Well, the electron loses all the energy it gained to get back to 100 joules. So we see here it loses, loses 300 joules of energy. When it does that, guess what happens? It's not able to go back home. It's like, okay, I want to visit you, E4. We had a great time together being in your orbit, but now I got to go back home. Then the electron loses energy as it goes back home to its ground state. Now at its ground state, the electron now once again has 100 joules of energy, okay? While it's losing the energy, if the amount of energy that's released has a frequency that matches visible light, guess what we see? Light, and when we see colors. So this was an explanation that Bohr was able to give. The scientists are like astonished. Oh my goodness, this is excellent work, Bohr. Now we see all these colors. Now, of course, Fun about this, July 4th, all those fireworks, all of the different lights, not the patterns, just the lights, the beautiful lights, the colors, all of those use these principles right here. You take a piece of, well, 
some kind of chemical, apply heat or electricity, get those atoms excited, get the electrons there excited, they're going to jump up to a higher energy level on the way down, they release the light. You get blue color, you get yellow color, you get pink color. Now, the thing I would like to find out, which I keep telling all of y'all, just in case you know somebody who knows somebody, is how they get those shapes, how they get the fireworks to have different shapes. That's not chemistry. That's beyond chemistry. We just tell you where the light comes from and the colors come from. I want to know how do we get the shapes? Because where I come from, we don't do all that stuff. We just have... The kind of what's what's the firework? Not even the firework. It's a thing that makes noise. Pat pat pat. I'm like this is not as exciting. <laughs> Once you see July Fourth fireworks, I'm sorry. When I go back home, they're like pat pat pat. I'm like, is there some light? <laughs> is there some excitement? <laughs> we don't have that kind. Okay, we just don't have it. But anyway, he was able to introduce that concept, and so he was very popular for that. By the way, this picture here. It's just uh, communicating discrete values. So it's kind of like if you're going from the ground to the top, I don't need to know that you need this whole picture to get discrete values. There, there are no actual steps, right? This ramp is kind of like gradually, continuously. It would be like taking all the steps and then one step kind of fades into the other. And that's how you get this one here versus this one here. The steps are all distinct, right? One step is different from the other. They're doing all this to tell you what quantize is. Quantize, therefore line spectra, therefore distinct, is different from continuous. Continuous. Okay. In the continuous, you have more like, you know, something bleeding into something else or fading into something. So I'll say here, you kind of have fading or bleeding right where things are kind of continuous you don't have distinct or yeah so that's the idea here the difference of these two so we see Bohr's model the other thing besides him explaining the different colors and stuff his model worked for hydrogen only Sadly, his model did not work for the other elements. It's not his fault. The technology he had at that time and the knowledge they had at that time, this is the best he was able to do. So he said you have a nucleus here in the middle, you have a different energy level, and electrons can go from high energy level to lower energy level in the process. They release light. So they're showing you here, oops, what did I do? They're showing you different amounts of energy that's being released as the electron goes back home. So, of course, I explained all this before. The quantum jump, quantum leap. When you have electron moving between orbits. I don't know if y'all watch that old, oldie TV show. Is it called quantum leap? I think it's called quantum leap. I never understood what they call it, but I got it. It's like you're, you're, you're jumping from your reality to a different reality, from the ground state to the excited state, right? It took me a while to kind of understand what the concept was there in that show, TV show. I'm that kind of person, right? Everybody goes somewhere. We all go somewhere, and everybody's just chill, laid back. I'm asking like 100 questions. <laughs> that's just me. That's, that's why I, went, I got into science, you know? Everybody's like chill, laid back, seeing stuff. Th things are off, but they don't have questions. Not me. I'm like, why is that off? Why is that over there? Why couldn't it be over there? They're like, why are you asking all these questions? Why are you not asking questions? <laughs> Yep, that's me. So, yeah, going from a ground energy level to excited state, that's called a quantum leap, from one reality to a different one. So we're told, the, the, of course, the electron is normally found in the ground state. I already discussed that. And then when it gets extra energy, it's in the excited state. And, of course, this is temporary. It always has to go back home to the ground state. And let me see what else. I'm trying to see. Okay, so I will get to this part here and just introduce it and then we'll stop right here. So, uh, as I say here, excited state, as exciting as they are, are unstable. 
So the electrons have to fall back to the ground state in one or two quantum jumps. As they fall back, they release light. So we're told here, photons of light energy are released with a frequency proportional to the energy difference between the two levels. So what they're trying to say here is, photons of light energy are released. Okay, so as the electron is going back to the home state, so let me go ahead and see, let me show you this. In reality, the space between the orbits aren't, aren't as even as it looks. Yeah, it's more like this, right? It's not as even as it looks. So let me try to show this a little bit like this. So let me say energy level one, energy level two, energy level three, energy level four. So when the electron is going back, let's say the electron started off right here in the excited state, and it's E1, trying to go back to its home state right here. We're told that photons of light energy are released. So there is a wave that's released here that is light, okay? With a frequency proportional to the energy difference between the two levels. So the light here will have a frequency and the frequency we get is comparable or proportional to the gap between these two energies. So since this gap is huge, then we have a huge change in energy. Therefore, frequency is going to be large. Okay. So what they're trying to say is if the electron has to jump a lot to get back to its home level, then it releases a high energy. So it has a high frequency. Okay. That's what that is. So the frequency is proportional to the energy difference between the two. And so, yeah, and then we're told here the energy release appears in the line spectrum of the element. So once this light comes off, when you're looking at the spectrum, we see a color, a color band. So this comes off and produces this color band. Boop, one. Then a different transition produces a different color band. This other one produces another color band. And then eventually each transition of the electron produces a color band and you have a bunch of different color bands. Ooh, I don't know why my eyes are gray. So here they're showing you, I guess, electron right here. So these are actual numbers, not like the ones I made up earlier. I have my electron right here, energy level one. The electron does what? Oh, it gains energy and goes to energy level two. Now it's at an excited state. Then it has to come back home. And for it to come back home, it has to lose the energy back to its ground state. And as you can see the gap in the energy or the gap in the levels matches the amount of energy that's given off. And then it matches, it, it's similar to the frequency. So from here, we have a huge gap. Hopefully you can see that. So the contributions of Niels Bohr. In other words, let's sit down now and say, what did his work, how did his work actually help us? Okay, so Niels Bohr, when we're giving him credit, he got an award. He suggested a reasonable explanation for the atomic line spectra in terms of electron energy. So he's the one who's finally able to tell us where all this light is coming from. The atomic line spectrum, we know it exists because of Niels Bohr. So it's, it's I mean, I don't watch the Grammy and the Emmy and all those things they have on TV that much, but sometimes I watch it when they, when they call the winner and the winner is whatever, and they say why they won. This is why Niels Bohr got credit. Okay. I mean, I, I've never, I don't think they televise these things because, <laughs> you know, people, I'm a, I don't know if people watch. Honestly, I don't know because I have never attended any one of these events where they give people awards for their discovery. It's more like you see it on TV, right? There isn't a big show about it. People get dressed up and say, oh, you're getting credit for your work. No. So it, we see it in books. We see it in the news. But the idea is this is one of the things he came up with. He introduced the ideas of quantized electron energy levels. Those different n values, those were energy levels with n, n equal 1 being the smallest one, equal 7 being, you know, larger than n equals 1. He told us that n equal 1 is small energy level. And then later on, of course, as the n value increased, then we have a greater energy level. We would never known, we would never have known about the idea of energy levels in 
the orbit if it wasn't for Bora. So we're giving him credit. Good job, Bora. You get an award for the following things. And because of what he came up with, he inspired the work in other scientists. They took his idea of, in the quantum mechanical model, took his idea of energy level and graduated it into principal energy level, not just old energy level. Now it's called principal energy level and it's identified by principal quantum numbers. So when we meet next, we'll talk about the new, the new West um, atomic model called the quantum mechanical model. And then maybe you will see why it's not so popular. I'm not saying it's bad. I actually really like the new model. I don't know why other people don't like it. I mean, I'm like, okay, okay. But I think it's neat. Once I got over the fear of it and, and asked myself why, why, and, and got made peace with the model, now I like it, you know, now I like it. But yeah, so in our next lesson, we'll talk about the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Let me just say about the word quantum, right? I feel like I will butcher the story. In the story of, uh, is it Ants? Was it Ants? Corey, the TV, not the TV, the movie, the superhero, was it Ants? Okay. Ant-Man, my bad. I told y'all, don't. he's here to help me out. In the story of Ant-Man, when his mother, was it his mother? Okay, I think I should know the story. Well, it wasn't his mother. It was the, the girl. It was the girl that he liked, her mother, right? Who was lost in the quantum world. Right. Okay, I'm sorry, y'all. Listen, I'm good at chemistry, nothing else. <laughs> I know scripture and I know some chemistry, everything else. That's why he's here, to keep me on track. In that story, when the, when the mother got lost in the quantum world, right, the other realm, they had to go find her. But the reason why she even went there in the first place was things were getting complicated in, quote, unquote, our world, right? So to try to fix things in our world, they try to go very deep. And they said the atomic level is not good enough. Going to the surface of the atom is not good enough. We have to go inside the atom. So the idea is when we talk about quantum level, we're talking about inside the atom. In other words, it's deeper than what you even understand. So when they said in the movie, we're going quantum, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is exciting. My husband just looked at me like, it's okay. <laughs> I'm like, it's going deeper. Anyway, we'll catch up next time and talk about the quantum level, the even deeper level than anything we can imagine when it comes to the atom, okay? So hopefully you guys can come back and we can talk about this. Have a nice evening. It was called Ant Man. <laughs> I'm like, is it Ant? <laughs> is it Bug? I was about to say the Bug's life. Oh my goodness, I'm so embarrassing. That's okay. Bye, Joy. See you.